Great. Well, good, good afternoon. Uh, this, this morning, uh, as, as I did the introductory remarks, I was pointing out that you, we wanted to focus uh, your attention on a number of the major fact questions that are going to be being addressed uh, throughout the weekend and for you to keep your eye on ascertaining what type of evidence there is uh, to support these. And we're going to have a full day tomorrow dedicated to that. What I want to do this afternoon uh, is to start pointing out some of the legal principles that we need to be cognizant of uh, in, in attempting to discuss the viability of a parallel case uh, that will that will uh, go along go along with the other case that is that is actually being done now uh, by the other big law firms. Okay, that that we talked about this morning that uh, the passing of JASTA may well give them the opening to continue to pursue uh, their thesis. Uh, predicated upon the findings of the 9-11 Commission, supplemented by the 28 pages, uh, and continue to dig in, trying to find out whether or not the Saudi government uh, and other financial institutions are legally liable for what was done uh, if, in fact, the 9-11 Commission report as to how this all happened is accurate. Uh, as I pointed out this morning, the purpose of this week's gathering is to try to determine what the state of present, present evidence is and what legal theories that we, that we have available uh, to determine whether or not there is grounds for a, a parallel case pursuing a different theory uh, of the case and uh, supplementing the range of defendants who have been designated by the, by the other case uh, to have some joint tortfeasors available. Now, I, I point out at the beginning of this, uh, this legal discussion uh, that, that uh, I'm not here today to, uh, to support uh, or defend or to attempt to criticize any particular of the alternative legal theories that might be available. You've heard a few discussed here today, uh, just recently with the panel, uh, the discussion of whether or not the United States government officials uh, in the FBI and the CIA and the other uh, agencies that have been involved were simply incompetent uh, or whether or not they may have been more involved in some type of uh, scienter or uh, evil intent uh, in actually being involved in setting up uh, some of these uh, Saudi uh, dupes. Has been, has been talked about before. And you just keep in mind that there's the old adage in law that, uh, that the people who are responsible for something like this would much rather be considered to be a fool than a knave. Uh, and th that seems to be the nature of the debate partly going on now about what particular types of alternative theories may develop uh, out of the evidence. But what I want to do this afternoon uh, I want to be able to direct our attention to a number of important legal principles because uh, one of the things that's going to be being proposed this weekend uh, by the, the people who've been working at this for 15 years is that a specific law firm be set up or a legal team be set up to pursue the investigation, the expert evidence, uh, the an evaluation of the legal theories, etc., to, to be the base of an operation to try to see whether or not such an additional supplemental or parallel legal case uh, is going to be viable. Uh, and what, 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 uh, what, what, I, what I want to be able to do as sort of a, a senior, uh, not so much senior statesman as a senior class member uh, of the baby boom generation, who's been uh, trying these types of cases for going on 50 years now, as it turns out, uh, that uh, I've been engaged in, in prosecuting and defending uh, political cases, uh, dozens uh, of them by, uh, over this 50-year period, uh, these politically charged uh, cases. Uh, and what I want to do is I want to set forth what might be considered sort of the Ten Commandments uh, that are our, our uh, people who are going to be considered to be part of this legal team uh, need to keep in mind. 
and that you as potential lay persons who are participating and supporting this type of an endeavor need to keep this in mind so that you will see as the legal team, if one is developed, uh, what the principles are that they're following that you'll understand and appreciate them. One of them has been touched upon a number of times and what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll be careful not to wander off into too many war stories. Uh, you, you may know how trial lawyers are. Uh, they, they love to tell war stories about the, the various trials that we've been involved in. But I will share a few of them with you to dramatize the, some of the principles that we need to observe. One of these principles has been that, that whoever is being involved in supporting the legal team and who are working on the legal team, uh, they have to be ready to be aggressively criticized by the mainstream media. Not just ridiculed lightly, but aggressively attacked. Uh, and, I, and I'll give you one particular example. Uh, in the Iran-Contra case, uh, we at the Christic Institute had filed the Iran-Contra case back in May of 1986. Uh, and there was a dead silence about this. Uh, we talked to everybody about it. We talked to people at the New York Times. We talked to people uh, in NBC News. We talked to PBS. We talked to people in Congress about it. There was dead silence uh, on this uh, until October 5th of 1986 when Eugene Hassenfuss was shot down uh, by the Nicaraguan uh, Sandinista government uh, over Nicaragua uh, in a C-123 uh, flying weapons into the Contras in complete violation of the Boland Amendment that had been passed by Congress. And the, the, uh, all that news hit the stands, and, uh, and right away uh, we were called, finally, uh, people kept saying, listen, isn't that the thing the Christic Institute's been trying to tell everybody about? And so what happened is that the journalist community, uh, actually, who had said nothing about this, uh, gathered together, uh, at the New School for Social Research here in New York City uh, or the Avenue of the Americas in, uh, in, in West 12th Street. And they filled up a, a place the size of this with professional credentialed journalists uh, in the room. And, uh, and uh, uh, I remember that uh, Leslie Coburn from CBS uh, had uh, undertaken to try to do a piece for West 57th Street on this. And uh, the, I got up and I presented to the entire room of some maybe 300 uh, credential journalists, what w what we were saying at the Christic Institute about what was really going on behind the whole Iran-Contra crisis, that this wasn't some young individual renegade lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps that had somehow gone around and recruited old retired military experts off the golf courses, you know, outside of Washington D.C., uh, and happened to slap together this, you know, uh, slapdash uh, weapons supply operation. This was a high-level coordinated criminal conspiracy on the part of high-level government officials in the CIA and in the White House uh, being run directly out of George H.W. Bush's vice presidential office and his national security advisor, vice presidential national security advisor, advisor Donald P. Gregg, was helping to coordinate this whole thing and that he was the CIA case officer for Felix Rodriguez, who was running the Ilopango airlift out of, the, out of Central America, uh, and we've been telling everybody this. And so when uh, we got done making this presentation, people's jaws were kind of hanging open in the room, and, uh, and somebody stood up and they said, Leslie, Leslie Coburn from CBS, uh, are, do you believe that what the Christic Institute is saying is true? And she got up and she said, look, I'm just speaking for myself now, not CBS, but I can tell you, I've looked into this and I believe that it's true. And there was this whole rumble went around in the room, and one of the journalists stood up and they said to Warren Hoag, who was the foreign desk editor of the New York Times, who was standing there on the, on the forum with us, and they said, Warren, why hasn't the New York Times printed anything about this? And he said, gee, I don't know. Uh, and, uh, and so one of the other people in the audience stood up and now made bold, stands up and says, look, would you give us your promise that you'll send somebody down to the Christic Institute to gather this information? And he said, uh, uncomfortably, he said, okay, 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 I'll do that. And the next week, he sends down a young fellow, like 26 years old, who was in fact the, uh, a reporter for the agricultural section of the New York Times. And uh, this, fellow, this fellow didn't even know who the, the uh, FDN Contras were. He didn't, he didn't even know who they were. So I explained the whole thing to him. I gave him all of the details of this, and I could see him writing like mad. Uh, you know, like he could see Pulitzer Prizes, you know, dancing in his head. And so I give him the whole thing, and he goes back to, he goes back to, to New York. 
I was down in Washington, D.C. Was, he goes back to New York, and uh, uh, two days pass, three days pass, four days pass, a week passes. I give him a call, and I say, Neil, what's the story? You know, you said you were going to do a story. He says, well, look, look, i gotta, I got to come back down and talk to you. He, co he comes back down to talk to me, and he says, look, i got a problem here. Uh, my my uh, uh, my editors at the New York Times tell me that uh, that you're you're giving us information that's uh, hearsay information, that you weren't there to to see them unloading the cocaine, you weren't there to see them loading the weapons, you didn't uh, see the weapons being handed over. I said okay, uh, first part, first party witnesses. So I took him around and I introduced him to pilots that were flying the weapons in. We showed him the uh, end user certificates, the false end user certificates. We showed him the uh, the, uh, the serial numbers on the weapons that were being smuggled. Uh, we, we talked to the pilots, we brought him in. They showed him the landing codes to land on John Hull's ranch. They gave him the secret code words you had to use to land on the ranch. So he says, oh, this is it. Pulitzer, here, here I come. And so he goes, he goes back to New York, uh, and I don't hear anything. Two, three, four, five days, six days, seven days. I call him again. I say, Neil, what's the story? Why am not you doing it? He says, look, i got to come down and talk to you again. He, come, he comes back down. He tells me, he says, look, here, here's my problem. My editors keep telling me that if I'm going to write anything about this story, it has to be negative. It has to be negative about your investigation. It's got to be negative about what your, your assertions are that are being made here, uh, or else I can't write anything. And so, you know, I was kind of dumbfounded by that whole thing. So I said, look, let me, let me tell you an additional story and see if this will get you there. And I told him that after we'd done our preliminary investigation and prepared all, all the Iran-Contra case and prior to our filing the RICO uh, complaint, I had, I had taken all the information over to see Scott Armstrong. Scott Armstrong was the head of the National Security Archives in Washington, D.C. Uh, he had been the chief, one of the chief investigators for Peter Rodino. Uh, on the House Judiciary Committee investigating the Watergate burglary. That's how I knew him, because you know I was at F. Lee Bailey's office. We represented James McCord, uh, the wiretap specialist in the in the break-in, and he's the guy that blew the whistle on Richard Nixon. Wrote the letter to Judge Sirica blowing the whistle on the plumbers and all that. So I knew Scott. So I go and I sit down with him and I give him all this information. And Scott says, "This can't be true. This can't be true. What you're saying. If this were true, I'd know it." He said. I said, well, actually, it is true, and you apparently don't know it. Uh, and so I think you should spend a few days checking up your sources and, and see what you think. He calls me back three days later. He says, Danny, come on over. Come on, you've got to come over. So I went over to the National Security Archives. It was just two blocks from our office at the Jesuit National Headquarters. So I, I went over there. He sits down. He said, my God, he said, this is true. I talked to Cy Hirsch, and I talked to some other guys. They've all confirmed this. He said, look, I'm, here's what I'm going to do. He says, I'm going to go over to see Peter Rodino. Uh, he's still the chair of the House Judiciary Committee. They have the authority and the responsibility for bringing up articles of impeachment. And this stuff, this stuff here that you're saying, these are impeachable offenses. Not only against Ronald Reagan, George H.W. Bush, Donald Craig, you know, Bill Casey, uh, the head of the CIA, you know, that, that uh, uh, Ed Meese, the, his uh, national, and his other people. He said, this is, this is tremendous. I'm going to go over and talk to him right away. I'll call you back in a couple of days. Well, he's, I'm going to get him to do... I'm going to get him to set up a special select committee inside the House of Representatives and the Judiciary Committee, and he'll have me chair that. You know, he loves me, he said, because uh, because uh, I was actually the one that got uh, uh, Butter Alexander Butterworth to tell about the secret taping system inside Nixon's office. He said, so that's what really broke the whole uh, Watergate case uh, in the impeachment of Nixon and everything else. So he'll make me the chairman, uh, make me the chief of staff for that committee. So I said, great. So uh, I leave, and two days pass, three days pass, four days pass, five days pass. I don't hear a word. So I call up over there, and I, I get a hold of Tom Blanton, his, his assistant. I say, Tom, Tommy, what's the matter here? I haven't, I haven't heard from him. He says, Danny, you've got to come on over. So I, so, I, so, I, so I go back over. I go back over, and I sit down with Blanton. Blanton's got his head hanging down. He says, Danny, he said, you know, I feel like shit, he says. Uh, you know, he says, uh, uh, he says, Scott went over and talked to Peter Rodino. Uh, he brought a copy of your complaint, and he gave it to him. Rodino sat there and looked through the whole thing, and Rodino said, he said, he turned to Scott and he said, Scott, this is terrible. This is outrageous. He said, he said, well, if, if what's being said here in this complaint is true, why then, I mean, I, I've been telling my constituents for years that if they didn't like the way that American foreign policy was going, they ought to write a letter to their congressman. Uh, and, and if the congressman doesn't do anything, you ought to elect somebody else. Put another congressman in there. But if what's, what's, what's being said in this complaint is true, why then, why then we haven't even been in charge? 
I'm not going to allow the United States Congress to investigate anything like that. Is what he said to him. Okay? So I tell this story to Neil, this agricultural reporter from the New York Times. And he goes back, and the New York Times writes his first story about the Christie Institute lawsuit, saying Dan Sheehan is running around Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. irresponsibly telling third-hand stories about aging congressmen. And that's all it said. You know, it didn't say what, who was the aging congressman, what was he told, you know, what was his response. You know, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, they're basically representing the chairman of the Judiciary Committee as an encompass mentis, you know, uh, who, who you shouldn't even say anything to the newspaper about. So that this, is, this is the kind of thing that you can expect uh, if you really start moving on this type of a, a politically charged case. Uh, uh, and, uh, and you're also going to be attacked not only from the, the right, which is totally to be expected, because they've drunk the Kool-Aid uh, by the gallon uh, that has been fed to them uh, by the 9-11 by the Commission, but you're also going to be attacked by the, the sort of harder core left, because they're going to try to want you to file the lawsuit against the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, and you ought to be filing the lawsuit against W. Bush. He's still alive. So is Cheney. Cheney's got a whole new heart. We may have him around for years. So we, you, you, we want you to sue him. You know, and uh, we want you to sue the, the, the CIA as an organization. They don't, they don't have any kind of understanding, many of the people, uh, about what the legal restrictions are on what you can actually do through the legal system and through the court system, primarily because the court system has not been set up to do cases like this. The court system is set up by the financiers who set up the original federal government, Alexander Hamilton and, and the other financial geniuses that wanted to have a centralized economic system and weights and measures and stuff for the, for the colonies. And the fact of the matter is they're not set up to actually challenge the government itself, uh, except that they've always known there's a risk, so they've set up the immunity statute. And it's, it's not, the foreign, not the foreign immunity statute that's just been set up as a, a restriction on, a, a caveat on by JASTA. But in fact, they have a general principle of sovereign immunity that no matter what kind of accusations you make about the government itself and officials inside the United States government, you cannot sue them unless they agree to it. So, so, so they, ha they have to agree to allow you to sue them. Uh, or you can, you, can, if you're, you can sue them under the Federal Tort Claims Act They've waived certain immunities uh, with regard to regular common law garden variety tort claims. Like, you know, if a, if a, a U.S. postal uh, office driver runs over some poor person in the street, uh, you can sue them under the normal common law theories uh, uh, in their capacity under the Federal Tort Claims Act. But you don't get any jury. You can't have a jury. You've got to try the case to a federal judge who has been appointed by the president of the executive branch. Uh, and uh, and uh, you not only don't get any jury, you don't get any uh, punitive damages. Uh, all you can get is your actual hospital bills or out-of-pocket costs. There are all kinds of restrictions they've placed on even uh, the, tor the Tort Claims Act. So the bottom line is that you need to understand you're going to be getting uh, aggressive criticism from the, the, from the extreme left. We're going to be criticizing you for not suing the CIA and charging them with being running lapdogs of the capitalist class. Uh, and so, so you have to be prepared for that. Uh, now, you, you, always, you always also have to remember that the judges, uh, any court that you're going to file this case in, state court or federal court, you've got to remember all of these judges are selected or appointed politically. You know, they're appointed by the executive branch. Uh, they are always appointed by a member of the executive branch who just happens to be the same political party that the judge is from, uh, and that the judge has always been in that political party, has been a, an apparat uh, in the political party prior to their being appointed. That's how they got there. Uh, and so that virtually all of the decisions that they make are political. Now, that isn't pertinent in every case, like, you know, a dog bites man case or, uh, you know, a, a domestic violence case particularly. But the, the bottom line is, as soon as you start to have a case that has substantial political implications, uh, they're going to be making political decisions. Uh, and and you, get, you get a whole bunch of these that, for example, in the Karen Silkwood case uh, that we did out in Oklahoma, 
we end up uh, asking for discovery uh, in the in the, the Silkwood case against the Kermagee Nuclear Corporation. Uh, and it turns out that the first judge that we got, uh, Luther Bohannon, absolutely refused to give us any discovery. We'd file, we'd file subpoenas for documents. Uh, the the Kermagee Corporation would ignore them. We'd file subpoenas to have them come to take depositions. They wouldn't bother coming. We'd file motions to compel, and Luther Bohannon just completely ignored them, never ruled on them, wouldn't do anything. We finally started going after him in the newspapers and saying that he was sitting on these uh, motions to compel, he wouldn't do anything. And so he finally uh, orders a hearing, uh, and we have a public hearing. He wanted to have it in chambers. We insisted upon having it out in open court. We come into the open court, and he starts raging at me, uh, saying that, you know, that you're a magpie running off at both ends, uh, as he actually put it. Uh, and, uh, and so, so anyway, he, he started sort of slobbering on himself and getting crazy. And so that what we did is we, we, we filed a motion to have him recused. And he got recused by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, we got a second judge, uh, Luther Eubanks, came in. Luther Eubanks was, was totally incompetent. Uh, I think I can say this now, uh, uh, only because everybody knows it. Uh, and, uh, you know, that we, we, were, we were taking a deposition of Jackie Saruji who was a woman who was writing a book about Karen Silkwood uh, in, in report. She came to the Congress and tried to get them to stop having any investigation about what happened to Karen Silkwood when she was killed on the highway on the way to meet with David Burnham from the New York Times to deliver a whole set of internal uh, documents from the Kermagee Corporation that showed that they were missing over 40 pounds of 98% pure bomb-grade plutonium from the facility. And she thought that it just meant that they were messy. Uh, and uh, uh, as, as it turns out, what she had stumbled upon, the muff documents, the missing and unaccounted for uh, records, is that the 40 pounds of bomb-grade plutonium was actually being smuggled to Israel uh, by the American Central Intelligence Agency and the high-level officials of the Kerr-McGee Nuclear Corporation because uh, the Kerr-McGee, the Kerr of that, was Robert S. Kerr, who was the chairman of the Senate Foreign, uh, foreign, uh, mil military appropriations committee, and so that the entire operation was a covert operation to smuggle the plutonium to Israel, and they had to share that plutonium. Israel had to share the plutonium with Iran uh, under the Shah, and then they had to share it with the with the Afrikaner government down in South Africa, uh, and that we had we had exposed this. In the minute that we exposed this. By this time, we were working on our third judge. We had a third federal judge brought in by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, and so we we uh, we brought we we filed that information with him. In the minute that we filed that information with him, he called a special a special meeting, saying that look, the CIA has contacted me, uh, and they're they're sending people out to see me uh, on Monday morning. I wasn't supposed to tell you about this. They wanted an in-camera secret hearing with me. Uh, to, to file a motion to, to dismiss the case, but I thought I had to tell you about it, so I want you here Monday morning. So I come into the court Monday morning, and there's Judge Tice, Frank G. Tice. He's up on the bench. He says, I'm glad to see you here this morning, Mr. Sheehan. He said, uh, I've, I've told you I've, I've, I'm going to have this meeting with the CIA people, uh, and I know you don't agree with this. I know you're going to object. I'll put it on the record. Uh, uh, he says, but, that's, but I've decided I'm going to have the meeting. You can't come into the meeting. And just then, Glenn Whitaker, the attorney for the FBI and the Justice Department, comes walking through the door with these three suits uh, from, the, uh, from the CIA, and they come walking in, and the judge goes into chambers with them, right? And then uh, Cy Hirsch, the investigative reporter from the New York Times, comes rushing in the door of the courtroom. This is the Oklahoma federal courtroom, the courthouse that was later bombed uh, in Oklahoma. They were in the courthouse. And in he comes, and he says, Dan, what's going on? What's going on? I just got a word from my CIA sources that they're out here on the Silkwood case. What's happening? So I explained the whole thing to him, all about the, the plutonium being smuggled to Israel, all the details, all the, the evidence we had about it. He said, oh, he said, gee, they're never going to let you get at that. He says, that's like, that's like trying to find out who really killed Kennedy. I mean, this is the chief investigative reporter for the New York Times. Uh, and not only that, but he didn't, say, he didn't print a word about it, you know, about what was happening in the Silkwood case. Uh, so the, And then Judge Tice comes out on the bench after 15 minutes. He gets up on the bench and he says, well, Mr. Sheehan, you can be, on the record, he says this. He says, well, Mr. Sheehan, you can be certain that it's sinister, uh, he says, but it's also most definitely secret. He says, this is just a glass mountain that you're not going to be allowed to climb in this case. 
So I am taking judicial notice at this moment that you filed your count one in this case under the Federal Civil Rights Act, charging that Ms. Silkwood had had her First Amendment rights uh, to meet with the New York Times uh, violated. She'd had her rights to uh, First Amendment rights to travel freely on the highway safely, interfered with. Uh, and she'd had her home uh, invaded, a violation of the Fourth Amendment, right of privacy, planting uh, 400 uh, disintegrations per minute of radioactive plutonium on the food and the refrigerator in her house. Uh, you've laid out these claims that are a violation of her Civil Rights Act. But I want to take judicial notice here that the Federal Civil Rights Act was passed in 1868, immediately following the end of the Civil War. And I'm taking judicial notice of the fact that the Civil War was fought solely for the purpose of freeing the black race from slavery. And therefore, the Federal Civil Rights Act applies only to black people. Uh, and, that, and since you have not, you've not alleged anywhere within the four corners of your complaint that Ms. Silkwood was a member of the Negro race, uh, I'm going to be summarily dismissing this count from the complaint. Dismiss the entire count on her, her house being contaminated, her being, her, her being uh, uh, run off, oh, excuse me, the part about running off the highway, being killed, her body disappearing for 48 hours, nobody being able to know where her body was. They finally found it 48 hours later in the morgue at the Oklahoma City uh, Hospital, a Jane Doe tag on her tail, or on her toe, with all of her internal organs completely missing. Okay? And that was not justiciable. That was not justiciable. Uh, because that was under the Federal Civil Rights Act, and uh, we hadn't claimed that she was a member of the Negro race. Uh, so that, what, and what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you here is that uh, uh, to the attorneys that are going to be working on this case, you need to be prepared to understand that the judge in the case that you're going to be doing is not going to be your friend. Uh, that you're going to have another lawyer in the courtroom at all times who is there litigating against you. And so you're going to have to be prepared to do that. So you're going to have to understand also that they are not going to give you access to the federal rules of civil discovery just because the law says they have to. Uh, and that that's what the entire rules of federal civil procedure were about, that were crafted the chair of that whole, whole uh, uh, committee was, uh, was uh, Shapiro, David Shapiro, who happened to be my professor at Harvard Law School on civil procedure, so I'm quite familiar with them all. But, but the, fact, the fact of the matter is they will not let you get at those rules of civil procedure. They will block you. They will resist you. They will ignore your motions to compel. So the fact of the matter is you're going to have to have a major mass-based movement uh, behind what you're trying to do. And you're going to have to have a full-time coordinator of the media who's going to be reaching out and putting the stories on the Internet, putting the stories into all of the alternative media, uh, going, going to try to get the major news media to report these things. Uh, you have to have a full-scale full operation going. And you need to have a field organizer, a grassroots organizer that organizes uh, out around the country and organizes task force and teams uh, in virtually every congressional district in the country. Uh, the, the Karen Silkwood case we had during the Iran-Contra case uh, that Sarah Nelson ran out of our office, our executive director, she ran the entire, entire grassroots operation around the country. We had like a thousand Christic action teams. Many of you may have been members of, of those. So that the, they were they were writing letters to the editor. They were if Oliver North showed up somewhere to go to speak at the Qantas Club or something, they would all come and fill the room, and, and jump up and down and ask him questions. You know, the, these are these are the kind of things that you're going to have to be prepared to do. This is not a normal case. Okay, uh, whatever the theory is that you come up with, which is an alternative theory. To the case that is that has been filed uh, by the other law firm, okay. So that so you you have to understand and do not think that just trying to get another official investigation is going to solve this problem. Uh, you if you get a, a professional investigation from the Justice Department or an official investigation from the United States Congress uh, or or any other type of question, that they are all political creatures. And that's why they're there, uh, you know, and they will they will undertake a political activity, uh, and they will try to keep you away from it. And I and I want to I want to call to your attention uh, something that uh, Gary Sick wrote. Gary Sick, uh, uh, Barbara Honecker wrote a book on this, but so did Gary Sick, who was a the national security advisor uh, for President Jimmy Carter in Jimmy Carter's negotiations with the Iranian government. 
uh, when our 52 American hostages were seized at the American embassy in Tehran. And Jimmy Carter, you remember, was trying to negotiate to get our hostages back. Uh, and during that negotiation, Gary Sick, Lieutenant uh, Colonel uh, Gary Sick, uh, uh, actually Lieutenant Commander uh, in the Navy, he, he actually was his assistant in the National Security Council. Uh, and it became perfectly evident that somebody inside the National Security Council was leaking the information about the state of these negotiations went to the to Bill Casey, who was the uh, campaign chairman for Reagan and Bush, uh, compete, uh, competing against Jimmy Carter for the presidential nomination in 1980. And we developed all the evidence that showed that, that Bill Casey, uh, and some evidence indicating that even George H.W. Bush, that may have gone with him on one of these occasions, had traveled to Paris, had, had traveled uh, to uh, also to Madrid, and had met with representatives of the Hezbollah to negotiate with them to keep the American hostages, to keep them in custody until after the election in 1980, uh, so that Reagan and Bush could could win by showing that Jimmy Carter was weak and vacillating and couldn't really even get our own uh, hostages back. And Gary Sick wrote a book about this uh, at, afterwards in the aftermath of all this called the, the October Surprise because a special prosecutor had been appointed to investigate all of these wild allegations uh, that this had actually taken place. And the special prosecutor came in with a whitewash report. And Gary Sick wrote a really interesting piece in the conclusion of his book called October Surprise in which he said basically that those of us who have lived in Washington, D.C. for 20 years or more have become accustomed to the various political scandals. Uh, an individual congressman uh, is caught with his hand in the till of his, his campaign uh, uh, funds for using them for private purposes. Or another, another uh, senator is found to be a, a persistent a womanizer uh, and caught uh, uh, swimming nude in the uh, pool on the, uh, the Capitol lawn. Uh, uh, and, and, and all of their colleagues rush in to excoriate them. And the news media flock in and, and reprimand them in and, and, and a, and a great celebration of showing how the system works and how they've called this person to account. He said, but, he said, uh, uh, these are petty offenses. And there's another whole category of political offense, he said. Uh, which he said that, uh, he says, there's another category of fence described by the French poet André Chenier as le crime poussant qui font trembler le loi. Uh, they're, they're, they're offenses so grave that they cause the very foundation of the law itself to tremble. And he said that, uh, he said, uh, we, we know what to do with someone caught misappropriating funds when confronted with evidence of a systematic attempt to undermine the very democratic political system itself, we all recoil in a general failure of nerve. Okay, and he, and he goes on to point out that that's what happened with regard to the October surprise. And he makes direct reference to the Iran-Contra case and how they completely backed off. All of the major political officials backed off from really pursuing what was going on in the Iran-Contra case. Uh, and in fact, and in fact, you may remember that the, we finally got a special prosecutor appointed. Lawrence Walsh was was handpicked, but only because uh, Ed Meese ran out on the, into the national media on October 25th of 1986 and said, "Oh, what do you know? Oh, gee, uh, we found this young lieutenant colonel all by himself ran off and uh, and ended up, uh, you know, selling tow missiles to the Hezbollah." and taking part of the money and putting it into a bank account in the Caribbean uh, to go to the Contras in apparent violation of the Boland Amendment. But fortunately, he's been fired now. But just to be sure, we're going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to write up a charter as the Attorney General asking for a special prosecutor to be appointed to determine narrowly whether President Reagan ever, in writing, specifically authorized the sale of tow missiles to the Hezbollah and the transfer of a portion of the profits to the, to the Contras in violation of the Boldman. And he figured that he would, he would stave off the entire rest of the investigation by narrowly, so narrowly defining what the, what the scope of the investigation was. And the special, the special panel for appointing special prosecutors of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals all the justices of which had been appointed by Ronald Reagan or George Bush uh, or George Bush Sr., that they'd all been appointed by them. They end up selecting as the special prosecutor 
the senior partner of Crow Dunleavy, the law firm that we beat in the Karen Sokwood case. They choose the senior partner of the, of the very law firm that we knocked over for a $10.5 million judgment, the largest civil judgment in the history of the United States up to that point in time, and brought him in as a special prosecutor. Now, I was glad because he's one of the few people on the planet that knew that we were completely right, you see, because he already had experienced that uh, the hard way. Uh, and so, so he did know that, that when we say something, you better bring it to the bank and bring your checkbook with you. Uh, so that so that we were the very first people that they interviewed, and we began to give them all of this information. And lo and behold, we managed to convert the special prosecutor to actually doing a real job. At which point, the entire constabulary in Washington D.C. turned on him and began attacking him, and charging him with you know flying on first class when he went back to Oklahoma on weekends uh, during his tour as the special prosecutor uh, and, and et cetera. So that you, you have to understand that the, the Republican and Democratic Party are joined at the hip. Not, not just, not just uh, when you come to the shore uh, and it is in all foreign policy, which is what we're dealing with in this particular case. Uh, but to, to give you another dramatic example, when when we were closing in on them and getting all of this information revealed, uh, John Kerry, who had been, uh, who I had actually uh, proposed to uh, Claiborne Pell, the uh, ranking Democrat on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, to be the chairman of a new select committee to investigate all the charges that we made, that I went to see Tip O'Neill, uh, Russ Hemingway, the head of the the director of the Fund for an Effective Congress, a close friend of uh, of John Kennedy's, you know, recommended I go see Tip O'Neill. He called Tip for me. I went in and saw Tip O'Neill, the Speaker of the House, told him the whole story. He sent me over to the Senate side to meet with uh, Claiborne Pell. Uh, and when Claiborne, Tip O'Neill said to me, he said, look, when, when, uh, when you ask him to set up this special select committee, if the, if the Democrats, if we win the Senate back in the fall of 1986, he said this was in June, the first week of June of 1986, he said, in the fall of November of 86, we're going to have the election. And if the Democrats, we can win back the Senate, uh, then you, you go over and talk to, to Claiborne Pell and get him to agree in advance that they'll set up a special select committee to investigate all of these charges. He's going to ask you who you think ought to head up that committee. You, you tell him John Kerry. He loves John Kerry. You know, we kid him, we kid him uh, that John Kerry must be his illegitimate son, he said. He loves him so much. You know, uh, Claiborne Pell thinks John Kerry is going to be president of the United States. And I said to Tip O'Neill, I said, that's funny, so does John Kerry. Uh, and uh, so I did. I went over and I recommended it to, uh, to, uh, to uh, Claiborne Pell. He, in fact, as soon as the Democrats won, they set up the special select committee. We start hand delivering all this information to John Kerry. End user certificates, you know, tail numbers on the airplane, secret code words, you know, witnesses, the, the pilots that we got to, to tell all about it. And that they're overwhelmed by all of this stuff. And they actually put together a preliminary draft of a report from the Senate Select Committee on Terrorism and Narcotics telling that everything that we're saying in the, Karen, in the uh, Iran-Contra case is true. We get a copy of the draft of it. So we know what they were getting ready to say. And then all of a sudden, I get a call from Russ Hemingway. And Russ says, Dan, I got I to gotta talk to you right away. He said, look, I got to tell you, I just came, just this minute, came out of a meeting. I was meeting with John Kerry. He said, and we were having a private meeting. Uh, and in walks uh, the uh, Democratic senator from Michigan, uh, Don Regal, uh, comes in. And he says, John, I got to talk to you privately right away, right away. And uh, John Kerry, rather casually, says, no, no, that's okay. You know, Russ is fine. You, he can stay for the meeting. And Regal says to him, look, uh, I've just come from the leadership of the Democratic Party, and they have said that they've been approached by the leadership of the Republican Party. And they're saying that, look, if, if, you, if you all by yourself make a decision to drop this investigation of the whole Iran-Contra enterprise and the smuggling of the cocaine and the assassination operations they're engaged in and that whole off-the-shelf enterprise that, that, you, that, that you're looking into, then, uh, and it's totally up to you. They, the Democratic leadership wants to make it clear it's totally up to you. Uh, but if you do decide to drop this, the Democratic Party leadership wants me to tell you that they will be very, very, very grateful to you personally in the very near future. And I, and I said, so I said, I said to uh, Russ, I said, what the hell does that mean? 
He says, that means the vice presidential nomination when Al Gore runs for the presidency in 2000. That's what he said to me. Now this this is like in this is like in 1992, you know, uh, right when when uh, Gore and in uh, in uh, Clinton are getting ready to run. So I mean that's how far in advance these people on the inside know how things are being arranged, okay? And in, by the the only, the only reason that, that John Kerry didn't wasn't given the nomination uh, in the year 2000 with Al Gore is because Al Gore was so royally pissed off at at Clinton for having lied to him about the Lewinsky affair that, uh, that, uh, that he actually selected instead of John Kerry who he was directed by the Democratic Party leadership to make his vice president he, he, selected, he selected Joe Lieberman because Lieberman was the only guy on the United States Senate who stood up on the floor and chastised Clinton for lying personally to his own best friends about this and that's exactly why Al Gore picked him to be his vice president. And you remember that Al Gore did not allow Hillary Clinton or Bill Clinton to make one single solitary appearance on behalf of his campaign during the entire campaign in the year 2000. Okay? And so the, the, I've lived this for 50 years. We've been in Washington, D.C. for 20 years. We've been on the inside of these things for a long time. I'm telling you, this is one major hill that you're talking about climbing. But we have climbed a few. Uh, in the past, all of us together. And the fact of the matter is that this, this may well be the biggest hill ever uh, to climb uh, because of the, the type of theories that, uh, that are being implied by some of this evidence that is being developed are so extraordinary that they qualify as one of these types of crimes that shake the very foundations of the legal order itself. Uh, and that's exactly what you're what you're dealing with here. So I, I just wanted to give a, a few uh, principles and lessons to the uh, the uh, women and men who are going to be the legal team that are uh, planning to uh, evaluate this, investigate this, uh, and to all of you out there, not only the people who fill the, the audience here, but the people all around the country and around the world that are listening on the internet. You know that. You, if you're going to support this operation, this uh, undertaking, you need to be prepared for this type of a confrontation. And you need to not wilt in the face of this. And so you need to be extremely careful about who you select as your plaintiffs. Uh, listen to me what I'm saying. You need to be very careful about who you're selecting as your plaintiffs. There's a complex operation going on here on the part of the American uh, institutions attempting to buy off the, the families uh, of the 9-11 victims, uh, setting up an entire fund to pay them off, to get them to waive any claims that they have against anyone. Uh, there's a whole effort underway to deal with just laying it off onto this, this group of uh, Saudis, possibly even some individual financiers of the, of the Saudis if they, can't, if they can't avoid that. But they don't want to hear what this group is planning to talk about. They don't want to talk about the implications of this. Uh, whether or not they're, they're perfectly willing to be considered to be fools uh, in complete incompetence, you know, in, in, in lying bold-faced about not having had any advance warning of this, but they don't want to talk about the fact that the able danger a military exercise was going on at the same time, the vigilant guardian. They don't want to talk about the fact that, that uh, somebody could have taken an opportunity to launch this at attack right at that exact same time. Uh, they don't want to talk about any of that stuff because all of the implications of that require very high level, very sophisticated coordination. And they do not want that talked about. Okay? So you, that I'm saying, so you got to understand, if you select an individual plaintiff, uh, that the, the, the forces that you're dealing with potentially here will go to almost any lengths to buy them off, uh, to offer them everything that they've ever wanted and more. Uh, to buy them off individually, uh, so you need to be you need to be very careful. You have to have people who are dedicated, dedicated down to the very soles of their feet, to get at the truth of what's happened here, uh, and that they're not in this just to be remunerated. Uh, they're they're not in it for any personal advantage. So you have to be extraordinarily careful. In in closing, I have to you have to be extremely careful 
about who you name as defendants. Because you need to remember that the naming high enough level officials are going to cause them to invoke national security claims. They're going to refuse to produce uh, the discovery. The judges are going to go along with their national security claims. Uh, you, have to, you have to be extremely careful. So you need to have, as consultants to your legal team, people who are experts uh, at the, the particular trial court that you select, the court of appeals that has jurisdiction over that and who the personnel are on that particular court of appeals and have experience in litigating appeals in front of that court. And you need to always keep in mind that this case that you're talking about is going to end up in front of the United States Supreme Court. You need to understand that. So you need to keep your eye on who those personnel are. You know, and no matter how much the media wants to keep on claiming that there's this, this conservative side and liberal side of the court, we know that that's not true. All there is is a completely reactionary part of the court and a conservative part of the court. Okay. Uh, and it's not likely that Hillary Clinton is going to be appointing any major liberals, certainly no progressives, uh, you know, so that, so that you're going to have to craft this very carefully. And the, the mix is going to be a little bit different uh, because, because Justice Kennedy may no longer be the swing vote to craft your case to pitch it to Kennedy and looking at his past decisions, et cetera. So you're going to have to, you're going to, have to do this very carefully. This is going to be extremely high-level uh, litigation and you can bet that you're not going to have any big law firms lining up to help you okay uh, you're, you're, you're not going to get the Cahill Gordon litigation firm coming on board uh, you're not going to get you know any of the big law firms coming to help you you know uh, they will all cite conflicts that they have uh, that oh you know uh, we represented uh, somebody from from one of the potential defendants you know back a hundred years ago so so the bottom line is this is going to be a major challenge uh, you you have to gird yourself for this uh, you need to stay in direct communications with people who have knowledge about these types of cases at least on a consulting basis and what I'm saying is is that the key is, is having the kind of support from the people that's absolutely indispensable in a case like this. So you have to develop the grassroots organizing. You have to develop your media campaigns. And ultimately, you're going to have to, prior to the filing of your complaint, you're going to have to determine what the exact theory of your case is. You can't really go into a case like this saying, well, maybe they were dupes, maybe they were incompetent, uh, you know, maybe this, maybe that. You, you may be able to do that. And, you know, if a, a Boeing 757 were to land only on top of your private house, you as a plaintiff's lawyer, you can sue the airplane company, you can sue the people that are manufacturers, you can sue the pilots association, you can sue, you know, the weatherman. You can sue anybody you want, and then you can sort of peel them away as the discovery uh, unveils information. That isn't going to happen in this case. You know, you're going to get one shot at this. You're going to get one shot uh, at laying in what the, what the theory of the case is and who it is that did what to whom and who was involved in the support network. And you're going to have to put that in front of them because the, the judges are going to apply, just like the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals did, a heightened level of scrutiny a heightened level of scrutiny over the factual information that you bring in at the initial front end of this litigation, okay? And they're going to try to dismiss it under Rule 12b-6. They're going to say, ah, well, even if you could prove uh, what you say, uh, there's a legal problem that you can't really get at this. Or they're going to say that it's in ineffective in convincing us, uh, the judge, that is, uh, convincing us that you can in fact get the kind of court admissible evidence that you're going to need to prove every essential element of the claim even if we give you access to civil discovery. You're going to have that to confront. You're going to have to gather this information. You're going to have to, you're going to, have to put it all together. You're going to have to cross every T. You're going to have to dot every I. You're going to have to have a huge mass uh, support around the country. Uh, and you're working at that. That process is underway now. As the panel has said, there have been advances that have been made uh, even just recently, as recently as yesterday, that show that there's an advance being made in the progress on this. But <clears throat> the bottom line, in the, the, the last item I'll leave you with is do not drink your own Kool-Aid. Okay? The do not drink your own Kool-Aid. 
You know, don't come up with some great theory that necessarily the, the, the Dick Cheney sat in the bunker and coordinated all this from a single eye computer and just because that happens to fit your own ideological predisposition. The bottom line is you're going to have to work at this thing from the bottom up, gather your information, discern the patterns, identify your defendants, identify your causes of action, then go after this in a, in a big way. And once you start, once you start, you better not stop. You better not stop. You better not delay. You're going to have to go all the way on, on this thing. So that's just my advice uh, from 50 years uh, in front of the courts in this country. So that's, that's my advice, uh, and you can, I'm giving it to you for free. Okay. <laughs>